All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to BC212, a course on Christian apologetics. Welcome to all of you who are joining us online. Thank you for joining us. Okay, um, let's pray. The recording is on. So let's pray and we will get started. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for another day in our lives. Thank you for this opportunity uh, to get together and study and learn and uh, uh, receive your word. Uh, we pray that, Lord, you will uh, cause our understanding to be opened, help us to be clear, uh, to fully understand about uh, uh, these things, about questions that people may ask us, and help us to be able to give answers that will uh, address the problems, address the questions that people bring to us. Fill us with your wisdom and understanding. We ask this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Uh, we, uh, we started off um, last week on lesson number five. Uh, let me... Um, just one minute, I forgot to do something. Let me just do it. I forgot to bring them. Moving from one class to the other. All right. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. So we were in lesson number five. Uh, we just started lesson number five. Um, on common questions around creation. So we will do that today. We'll do lesson five today. Let me go ahead and share the notes. Uh, and then we will cover that today. So what we want to do is, we want to look at the biblical account of creation and answer some common questions about that. So I would encourage all of us to read Genesis chapters 1 and 2. Um, we're not going to read this in class, but I think uh, most of us would have at least read Genesis 1 and 2. And, uh, if, and it's always good to go back and read it again, just to see uh, what the Bible tells us about you know, how things were created. And then we want to answer some questions that generally come up in relation to Genesis chapters 1 and 2, and also some, let's say, theories within the Christian church of, uh, on Genesis 1 and 2, and say, okay, what should our position be? What should our stand be on some of these theories that we hear? Right. So, question one is something we addressed last time, where scientifically, the Earth and the universe are billions of years. Yeah. So universe, they tell us, is about 14 billion years. That's a long time, 14 billion years. Earth is about 4 billion years. And uh, we are saying, well, according to Genesis 1, and you start, you know, from Genesis 1, you go on, uh, well, it's only a few thousand years. And so how do we account for that? And uh, that's where we responded saying that, in the creative act of God, time, energy, and design came together in an instant. So what we would say take, would take so many millions of years, for God, it happened in a, I don't know, like a less than a second, right? Because God dwells out of time, outside of time, and He can compress time. Like the Bible says, a thousand years is like a day, one day is like a thousand years. You know, it's like it doesn't matter to God. He can compress time. So, in the creative act of God, time, energy, or power, you know, say, oh, it took so much power to do for this to happen. Yeah, God can compress all of that and design so much design happen. Right? So, in our minds, it's not a problem that if 
science says, hey, this fossil was so many million years old, or this mountain was formed over so many year, millions of years, or the universe was formed so many billions of Okay, you say, you know, you're doing your measurement according to your understanding. Respect that. But for us, regardless of how many millions of years or billions of years, you may say, we know that when God created, everything happened in a very mature way, mature state. And then he, we also understand that in his creative work, he set certain processes, rep repeating processes to happen. So if somebody says, but the universe is continuing to expand, that is okay. On the earth, plants are continuing to grow. It's not like every morning God is getting up and saying, let there be plants. <laughs> no, he said it once. He put in a system, a process. So this is continuing to repeat. Plants are multiplying, plants are growing. But he spoke the word thousands of years ago. And that is continuing. So whether we see that ongoing process in anything, plants, animals, any creation on the on the earth or in the universe, okay, it's fine. And God spoke and he released, not only did he create, but he put in his creation repeating systems and processes that will continue, you know, uh, things happening. So that is fine. You know, uh, that doesn't shake our faith in the fact that God created once and from then on it's going on. Okay. Now, question number two is the big question. Were there literally six days? Because when you read Genesis 1, on the first day, you know, God said, let there be light. Then next day. So that was the first day. Then verse 6, next day, let the water separate, uh, the sky and the earth separate. And he called it, there was morning, evening, it was second day, verse 8. So day by day he created. Six days. Seventh day, he said, work is finished. Nothing. He rested. So now, did all this happen only in six days? Or... Did it take millions or billions of years? Now, what has happened is, even in the Christian church, some other ideas have come. And we are only considering uh, three ideas, which are very prominent, which are an attempt to give an alternate explanation to Genesis chapter 1. Now, we are saying, yeah, there were literal days, 24-hour time periods. And each 24-hour time period, this thing happened. We are saying that. But in the Christian church itself, in the church itself, some other explanations have come. So sometimes it causes a lot of confusion. Whom to listen to? What is correct? What is not? Okay. So we are going to look at it. So one is, so three three things. One is what is called gap theory. Second is day theory. And the third one is a theistic evolution. They are blending evolution and God together, bringing it. And there are some Christians and scientists who do that, who believe that. Right. But uh, we want to respond to that and say, look, uh, we don't, you know, we don't necessarily agree. Uh, we don't agree to uh, these. So, gap theory is this. That between Genesis 1.1 1, 1 and Genesis 1.2, the gap theory says there could have been many millions of years. So, let's read Genesis 1.1 1, 1 and 1.2. 1, right? In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. So you can imagine, you know, God said, Le He created the heavens and the earth. That means the heavens means this whole universe with so many stars, billions of stars, all the planets. That's the heavens. In the beginning, He created the heavens 
And in this vast expanse, there is also one planet called Earth. She created all that. Then he took a break. Some millions and billions of years went by. Then suddenly he said, huh? Verse 2. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then he said, verse 3, let there be light. So the theory is between verse 1 and verse 2, millions or billions of years could have passed. They could have been life on the planet, on the earth, which is why, and they could have been all kinds of creatures, which is why we find fossils and we say, oh, this is the bone of some dinosaurus. It must have been so many millions of years old, like that, come up with. And it could have happened where between Genesis 1 1 and Genesis 1 2, there must have been a pre Adamic world. Something else must have been going on on the earth. Animals must have been there. All these dinosaurs, all these things must have been there. Uh, you know, all these kinds of uh, people like creatures. And, you know, because you find some bones, oh, this was this was man, he was three million years old, like that, people come up, right? So it must have happened then. And then all of that was, God destroyed all of that. And uh, God destroyed all of that, and that's why, with the big flood, and that's why Genesis 1-2 says, Earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the waters. There was, whole Earth was covered by water, and there was darkness on the earth. So that's why you're finding it earth like that. And then God is starting another creation. Verse 3. He says, let there be light. But this is only guess. You're guessing. You're putting it in, in the blank, in the white space. <laughs> you're putting something in between verse 1 and verse 2. Could have been. Might have been. And um, they, you know, they, the people who bring up the gap theory, um, they may use one or two verses. I think they use a scripture from Isaiah 14, where they talk about Satan, uh, Lucifer, uh, the son of morning. He walked upon the earth uh, in the Garden of Eden, uh, Isaiah 14. You know, uh, let me pick up that verse here. Um, uh, so it's talking about you know verse 15, 13 uh, I, will as I will ascend above the heights of the clouds I will be like the most high and um, it talks about him you know the one who made the earth tremble who shook kingdoms etc um, so you know, they say, okay, that means Lucifer was walking on this earth uh, before in times past. So that could be one um, argument or one uh, scriptural basis that they try to introduce. And I think also there's another scripture in Genesis, Jeremiah. And uh, uh, I forget where that was. You know, I didn't put it down here. But I think it's in uh Jeremiah 4 or something, where uh, it's, it's, it's a rather obscure passage um, that they say, oh, so because of this, um, there must have been a pre-Adamic world. I forget that exact verse. Anyway, so the point is that there is no clear or there's no you know clear statement. Uh, let me find this out here. Yeah, Jeremiah 4, 23 to 26, okay? Um, I beheld the earth, and indeed it was without form and void, and the heavens there had no light. 
I beheld the mountains, indeed they trembled, all the hills moved back and forth. I beheld, indeed, there was no man, all the birds of the heavens had fled. I beheld, indeed, the fruitful land was a wilderness, all the cities were broken down at the presence of the Lord by his fierce anger. Now, this is actually, you know, a, a, a passage that doesn't necessarily tell us or state that there was a pre Adamic world. They just use this passage in Isaiah 14 to try to support a pre Adamic world, but you cannot, cannot do it. It's not, um, uh, you know, it's not, we'll say, substantial. And, and these are in context to something else happening where. Uh, uh, in Jeremiah, he's speaking about impending judgment coming on uh, Israel from Babylon. And the destruction is, he's comparing the destruction that's going to happen to as though the earth was, you know, like in the beginning, like that is kind of destruction is coming. So he's just using a comparison, but it's, it is not supporting a pre-Adamic world. He's saying, look, Babylon is coming, king from the north is going to come, they're going to attack, they're going to destroy Jerusalem, and it's going to be like this. Right? Isaiah 14, uh, you know, Satan wanted to rise up above the clouds, above the heavens. Uh, it's just talking about him wanting to take the throne of God and exalt himself. Right? So you can't, you know, in, in a very strong way, support a pre-Adamic world from these two passages. So, our response to this gap theory is, look, it is based on an assumption. Uh, we cannot support it from Scripture. Strong, we cannot support it from Scripture. And so we will not preach it and teach it. We will not go and say, ah, between, between Genesis 1-1 one, one and Genesis 1-2, there were so many millions of years, put how many of our years you want. And we have to imagine God sitting and waiting, and time is time pass, <laughs> not doing anything. Something else, or something else is happening. Uh, it's not something that we can support in Scripture. We leave it like that. If it happened, fine. It's up to God. God knows. But we can't say for sure. So better not preach and teach that as though it is truth. I don't preach and teach. Leave it aside. If it was there, okay, well and good, it's up to God. It is not something for us to worry about. The second one, day theory, is where the assumption is that each day was many millions of years, or oh, many millions of years. So when it says on day one, God, you know, he said, you know, let there be light, that was so many millions of years, slowly stars were forming up. Millions of years. Then he day two, let the waters, you know, uh, let the firmament be formed above the heavens, so the sky and the earth, so many millions of years. So imagine, God is saying, be healed, and it takes you millions of years to get healed. And say, so what is this? Slowly you're being healed. <laughs> or whatever, you know. If if that is what you want us to think, that God said, let there be light. Slowly, millions of years, sun came. Slowly another star came. <laughs> what are you saying? And slowly this heavens, sky went up. And it took millions of years for the sky to go up. And when God said, you know, let there be plants, slowly, <laughs> plant came over millions of years. I mean, that's what you want us to think. One day it took millions of years. I mean, it is not logical. Or uh, they are fitting in evolution into that. No. But so you're saying, God spoke, but he did not have power. He had to depend upon evolution to produce it. Even that also is doesn't make sense to us. Right? So the second theory of one day being millions or billions of years, 
Of course, they use that scripture from 2 Peter 3, 8, one day is like a thousand years, thousand years is like one day. So it could have been some many thousands of years, we don't know. Well, in, when Peter was saying a day is like a thousand years, the context was different. He was saying, be patient, because God is not looking at time the way you and I looked at time. right? For God, time doesn't matter. You be patient. The Lord will come. The coming of the Lord is near. You be patient. For God, time doesn't matter. Uh, only for you and me, we, are, we look at it like that. So that's the context. That's what he's trying to say. He's not literally saying one day is thousand years or some millions of years. That's not what he's saying. The main point is you be patient. That's Second Peter three. So um, the other things about this day theory uh, is um, the same word. So when you study the Hebrew, so one one is it doesn't seem logical at all, right? That God would say, "Let there be light," and it took millions of years for these things to happen. It doesn't sound logical. It doesn't seem reasonable that if God was so powerful. He would need billions of years, millions of years to do these things. The other thing also, which is very uh, illogical is, or, or let's say, uh, sorry, uh, uh, the other thing that when you study from based on the Hebrew, the word day, right? The, the word day, you can study it. And it is also the same word that is used in Genesis 1, is used in other places. Okay, so... We look at some examples. I'm not looking at all examples, but if you look at ex Exodus 20, 8 to 11, let's turn there. So, same day, same day, word day in the Hebrew is used in many other places. We are looking at one example. If you go with me to Exodus 20, and we read verse 8 to 11, when God is when telling us about creation. And he tells us to do something. Exodus 20. Let's look at it. Verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath day of the Lord. In it you shall do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. Verse 11. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Okay. Now, so each day represents, example, one million years. Suppose we say that. So, okay, verse 11, in six days, say six million years or six billion years, the Lord made the heavens and the earth and all that is in them and rested the seventh day. He rested for seven billion years. So what is the commandment he's telling us? You also work like that. You also work six days. You also work six billion years. And the seventh day, seventh billion year, you rest. We only live 100 years or less than that. What are you saying? Same day is used. So it becomes illogical. Okay? That, so God is saying, you rest on the seventh day. Same day, Hebrew word is used uh, to talk about the creative act of, I mean, the creative work of God. Six days he worked, he rested on the seventh day. That same thing is, is used to tell us, you work six days, you rest, you take one day to rest. But if, you, if we say in Genesis 1, those days were millions or billions of years, then hey, that same thing is being used in another place. And it is actually meaning 24-hour days. Are you understanding, right? Because otherwise, uh, that word, you can't say, well, this word means billions of years in that place, and this place, it means 24 hours. You're changing the meaning of that word. I'm just giving one example. So, even from a, a Hebrew word standpoint, it doesn't make sense. So one is, you think about, just simply, is God going to wait millions and billions of years for light to come? Uh, that doesn't make sense. You look at the Hebrew word, that also doesn't make sense because it is being used in other places and it is very clear 
it is referring to a 24 hour period okay so um uh the uh, the whole uh theory the day theory making one day millions or billions of years doesn't make sense and then also if you look at other things in genesis 2 um where uh, you know if you know you apply the same logic you know if uh, um adam was called uh to you know uh he, he, Adam was, uh, man was created on day six. Uh, that means by the end of day six, he must have been so many thousands of years old. Then he, God brought Eve. He is what an old man. <laughs> yeah, Lord. If you are keeping the same thing, Adam was made on day six. But what Monday is millions of years old. Next day, Adam must have been. I don't know how old, how many millions. <laughs> seventh day. By the time seventh day came, how old Adam must have been? So these things don't matter. So day means keep it as twenty-four hours. Finished. Uh, last theory uh, is that some people they uh, and I'm talking about Christian in the church, right? They try to combine. They call it a theistic evolution that means god he created the heavens and the earth and then on the earth he let evolution happen and he was watching i was just guiding the evolutionary process some people believe like that So they are trying to merge faith in God with the evolution theory, theory of evolution. That God created everything and then he let evolution, you know, bring forth life on this earth and uh, cause uh, things to happen. So um, while that is an attempt to absorb or, uh, uh, you know, uh, accept the theory of evolution, make it part of faith, it is not correct. You know, it doesn't fit like the previous idea. It doesn't fit into Genesis chapter 1. So our position is that, uh, this is on page uh, 23, the six days of creation were literal 24-hour days. Leave it exactly as it says. And God did it in, those, in, that, in the way it said in Genesis 1 and 2. That's it. Don't try to put anything else. It is very it doesn't make sense. It's very confusing, and uh, it doesn't match with the rest of scripture. Okay. So some other interesting questions. You all with me so far? Yeah. Yes. Question. We see Joshua telling the son to wait for uh, another hour. So is there any uh, specific verse where it was like 24 hours or how did 24 hours originate for one day? Yeah, how did 24 hours originate for one day? Mm. How did 24 hours originate? For one day, I know um, in uh, in um, in Genesis one, it talks about the morning and the evening, right? But it doesn't tell us morning was twelve hours, evening was twelve hours. How do we get that twelve hour period? Other than what we know now, uh, the sun you know rotates on its axis once every twenty four hours. We know that, but in the Bible. Mm. The scripture reference, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we read in this what this yeah, this gap theory that uh, billions of years between Genesis one and two, 
but if you grammatically on the english wise if you actually look when verse 1 starts with in the beginning mm. and verse 2 starts with now mm. so it's like in reference to the continuation no i don't think there is a yeah. gap if you look in english yeah. grammatically yeah so after you know everything was formed and the focus and, shifts and, to planet earth yes yeah so it's a continuation yeah so even look in look at it that way as a, as a grammatical state yeah like the how somebody would write something it's fine going back to your other question i'm not i'm trying to think if there's any scripture that uh, tells us about the 12 hour period and i don't think there's any scripture actually saying 12 hours like we uh, it oh, genesis 1 says morning and evening you know day and night uh in the bible that 12 hour thing is not mentioned anywhere to my knowledge uh and i think yeah it's not mentioned anywhere and sun to stand still yeah so um so i think this un- uh, so the understanding of the 12 hour period came later on but the understanding of morning and evening day and night was there yeah that they from genesis 1 day and night morning evening later on we understood that the morning the day and night would be 12 hours and totally 24 hours so now we can say 24 hour period but it tells us it was morning and evening or day and night so we are working backwards because we have the additional knowledge of 24 hour period they had it as or genesis 1 has it as morning and evening day and night so i think yeah even if you just take it as day and night periods which today we understand it as 24 hours that's that's so another interesting question is how was a light on day 1 when the sun was created on day 4 so somebody said hey, i got you i got you <laughs> day 1 god said let there be light day 4 is creating sun and where is where is the light where did the light come from so then our answer is very simple when god said let there be light light came from him only god didn't need the sun to give the light then he said well how can you back it up with scripture okay let us go to the future so when we go to revelation 22 let's turn 21 let's go there so when we go into the future that means when god is creating completely new heavens that means this universe as we know it god will dismiss it fully gone disintegrate disappear then he's going to bring in new heavens new earth so it's like that time he's restarting not i just shouldn't say restart but he's making something totally new right so revelation 21 look at verse 1 he says i saw a new heaven and a new earth new heaven referring to the new heavens uh, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no more sea so everything was gone new something new got is created old is gone it just gone disappeared dis- dissolved in this new heaven new earth what is john seeing uh, verse 22 to 25 he says I was when I saw no temple in it for the Lord God almighty and the lamb are its temple the city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it for the glory of God illuminated it the lamb is its light and the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light and the kings of the earth shall bring the glory and honor to it so you look here new heavens new earth saying no need sun god himself is the light okay if that's the way it's going to be there it's not too difficult to say that okay in the beginning it was like that light came from god. when god said let there be light he was causing his glory to cause things brightness to be there then for your sake and mine he put one sun okay sun shine you constantly give this physical light to this planet or you know this part of this universe the solar system you emanate your energy you do this but in genesis 11 it is his glory 
causing brightness to come in the way he wanted it. As we are seeing here in Revelation 21, 20 to 25. Again, in Revelation 22, uh, I think there's a question on, online, we'll, we'll, we'll answer it. Revelation 20 to 5, again it says, There shall be no light there, they have no need of lamp or light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, they shall reign forever and ever. Lord God gives them light, God himself gives light. So that's exactly what happened. God himself was a the light. Then he put the sun, or he created all the other stars to serve their purpose. Okay? So let us uh, take, uh, let's see the chat, if there's any question there. Um, uh, Warren, you have a question? Yes, Master. Now, when we just spoke uh, earlier, we were talking about the uh, the twenty four hour day, and because the Earth revolves around its own axis twenty four hours, but uh, so if the uh, I mean it, the the sun would have would have to be there for night and day to happen uh, when the Earth is revolving. So if the if the sun was made on the third day, how would those first two days be calculated? Yeah, yeah. Good question. And I think that's the next question in the um, PDF um, as well. You know, where did this, um, uh, yeah, question number four, uh, it's, I, I think it's exactly what you asked. Um, so, again, so we, uh, we say, uh, let me just share that first and then we'll respond. So that's kind of basically similar to Warren's question. Question four, how could there be a day and night on day one uh, in Genesis 1-3 if the sun, moon, stars were all created on day four? So Genesis 1-14, fourth day, sun, moon, stars. Day one itself, it's saying there was day and night. But no sun, no moon. Earth was there. Earth is, was Genesis 1 1 itself. In the beginning, God created heavens and the earth. So, how, how would we explain it? Well, it's not too difficult. Again, you're looking into the future. It's in God Himself being the light. And imagine this whole vast expanse. The earth is there. And the earth is spinning on its axis. So, to create day and night, what we need is we need a source of light and we need the earth to be spinning on its axis, making it revolving, uh, rotating on its axis. And the light coming in from one direction. So that this, the part of the earth facing the light would have day, the other part of the earth not facing the light would have night. So answer would be simple, that God himself is a source of light, and he caused brightness to be in such a way, with the earth spinning on its axis, it would have a day and a night. One portion would see brightness for 12 hours, or for the, what we call as a day period, and the earth, the other part, not seeing brightness for 12 hours, or what we call as night. Right? So, uh, God would have set this up, right? while the sun, the moon, was not yet in place, specific to the solar system. So that's how we would respond to that, Warren. Uh, uh, is that okay with you, or is it a you know, follow-up question? Yes, Father. Uh, yes, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. Question? Yes. Go ahead. So, uh, my question is like uh, in chapter 1, uh, verse 27 and 28, uh, it says, Female and male. And again, in chapter 2, verse 18 says, uh, It's not good that man should be alone when God created female. Yeah. So, that, that's a good question. So Genesis 1, Genesis chapter 1 says God created um, um, man in his own image, male and female, he created them. Then chapter 2 is telling us the details of how all these things happened. 
so it's not contradictory, but chapter 2 is a further detailing or a further explanation. So chapter You know, day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, oh, God created man. And by the way, he created, you know, male and female. Uh, and he made them in his own image. And this was, he blessed them. He told them to be fruitful. He gave them all this thing. Okay, let me tell you some detail about male and female, how it happens. That detail comes in chapter two. Exactly. That, okay. This is how he made man. First, he made man. He formed him from the dust of the earth and all. So that one, that detail is not given in chapter one. It's more like outline. He made man. Man was in his image. And this all he told them and blessed them and all. Uh, the detail of how it all happened is first he formed man from the dust of the earth. He breathed into him. And uh, he told him to, he put him in the garden. He, you know, he told him to name all the animals and all that. And then he made him fall asleep. And then he formed Eve. Okay. So that is the detail. Chapter 1 is like summary, outline. So it's not contradictory. It is just like this is the overview. Now we'll give into the details. That's all. That's the difference between chapter 1 and chapter 2. Both are talking about creation. 2 is focused on Adam and Eve, how it happened. Yeah, oh, that's a good question. Five, question five. So, what is Genesis 1 to mean? Why was the earth without form and void? What does void mean? Now, uh, so some, you know, there's this, this gap theory. Sometimes it's also built on this meaning of this word void. Um, uh, does it imply God recreating the earth? Okay. So without form and void, without form means like a waste, like a desert. Uh, it doesn't mean without shape, but it's, there's nothing is barren. Void simply means empty. Something is waiting to be filled up. Filled up. Uh, it doesn't have to be ruined in order to be empty. So sometimes people use... Genesis 1 2. Uh, earth was without form and void. Void means ruined. Therefore, there was something before and that became ruined. Well, you can't base a whole theory on just one word because one word can have multiple meanings. And void does mean ruined, but it also means to be empty. Right? So you can't base a theory on just one side of the meaning of one word. You know. Uh, and uh, oh, it was ruined. So how was it ruined? God ruined it and recreated it and so on. No, right? So it just means that God spoke these things into existence. Earth was like this, and He was going to fill it up. He was going to, you know, bring uh, plants and animals and water and land, dry right? mm -hmm. land, and He's going to do all those things to this particular planet that is coming later on in chapter one. So. In the beginning, he created this whole expanse, and then his focus shifted to this work he wanted to do with one planet with respect to it. And with respect to it, he put the solar system in place, the sun, the moon, uh, things that for this thing, he put it in place. Right? So that is given to us in chapter one. But he shouldn't come up with some other theory when the intent of chapter one is that God is focusing on this planet and doing something for it. Let's say you can finish a few more questions. Um, question six, why does it say created and made? So in Genesis 1 and 2, there are different words that are used, uh, Hebrew words, as part of creation. So I've, I've, I've listed these words here. There is bara, which means to create. There is asa, which means to make something, or uh, and yatsar, which means to shape. Okay, These are not contradictory words. They're all part of what God was doing in Genesis 1 and 2. There are some things he created. He brought it out of nothing. There are some things he made, which is uh, he shaped it, or he, he brought it out of something that existed. 
and yet Zar means he shaped it. That means you know, like he he formed man, he gave shape to man from the dust of the earth. These are not contradictory. They are just saying in all that God did, some things were created, some things were made, some things were shaped from what they were made. It's okay. Right? Uh, it's not uh, 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 different. Or it's not uh, contradictory. And again, last question, what is this the greater light and lesser light? And especially how can you call moon lesser light? Because it actually has no light of its own. It's only a mass. It's not like the earth. It's, it's not having, it's not giving light. So oh, Bible is wrong. I would say, look, Bible is not a science book. It's just telling us what happens. Right? And it's using you know, it'll use poetic language, it'll use literal language. It's saying there is a sun which is giving light. And the moon is reflecting the light of the sun. So in some way, there is light coming from it. And it's just referred to as a lesser light. Doesn't mean it's Bible is wrong. Okay, it's just using language to communicate something. Okay, so uh, we shouldn't think that or oh, Bible is an error just because it's referring to the moon as lesser light. Just, just language describing what it's doing or some expression of poetic form. Just like even in, in English today, you know, we or in many languages, we have phrases, we have things that we say which are not literal, but they are just descriptive of something. Like when somebody says, oh, they, they tell somebody, oh, man, you're such a pain in the neck. It's not that he is causing pain in the neck. It's just, it's just a phrase you're saying, hey, you're causing me a lot of problem. <laughs> you know? That's all. It's not that he's literally some pain in here. No. Just a phrase. So like that, we're talking about different things. The sun is the greater light. The moon is the lesser light. Just describing what is happening. Okay. So we shouldn't get too upset about it. Okay, any questions on chapter 1 and 2 Genesis? Uh, we can always uh, um, Okay, this, wait, somebody, sorry, I didn't see this um, Some echo Microphone Yeah, go ahead Yes, Sorry? Yes. Um, so what we can say is Satan must have been around somewhere. Um, and we don't know when Lucifer became Satan. Like when did the angels fall? You know? When exactly that happened, we just know it happened. But when it happened, we don't know. We can say it had to have happened before Genesis chapter two, because when God put Adam in the in the garden, He said, "I want Genesis two fifteen. I want you to tend the garden, and I want you to guard the garden, keep it, guard it." So the implication is, Adam, you have to protect this place from the devil. Guard it. So we don't know exactly when Lucifer fell and became Satan. We don't know. We know it happened because Revelation 12 gives us the details. And Luke 10, uh, 18, Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning. So it happened. When it happened exactly, we don't know. But it had to have happened sometime before Genesis chapter 2. That much we can say. You know, before we don't exactly. Question? Can we can we tell like uh, there is a gap between the in the beginning God created and in Genesis to like um, the earth was without form. So when we read the fall of Lucifer, see there is written like when he fall down in the fall down like he fall down in earth. Mm. Or maybe the earth is like fully dark. So you're saying, can we say that 
Lucifer's fall took place before Genesis 1 verse 2. The earth was over for void, darkness. Um, honestly, I don't know. Like, we can't say for sure, like, when exactly it happened. Like, you know, somebody can take different positions. They can say, no, it happened in Genesis 1 2, or it happened before, or it happened after. We can take different positions. Uh, but I don't think, as far as I, to my knowledge, uh, I don't think we can be like very definite. What we know is it happened before Genesis 2, because God is saying you must guard the garden. When exactly happened? I don't know. We can guess, like, yeah, it must have happened before Genesis 1 2. I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay, let's um, pause here for today. We'll continue this tomorrow. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, have a good day. God bless. And if you have any questions, we'll definitely continue this tomorrow. Okay. Thank you.